Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. As you have been with us lately, and we've been going through the Old Testament book by book in a very rapid manner, and now we've come to the last book of the Bible, Malachi, the by the Old Testament, I'm sorry, the Old Testament, Malachi, and it's the last few, the last chapter of Malachi that I'd like to read, and, uh, but before I do that, I'd like to let you people know that uh, the notes that we use here are available to you. If you'll go to our website, that's theox, T-H-E-O-X, dot org, dot O-R-G, and go to the teacher's guide, look in that particular book of the Bible, the teacher's guide, and you can download and print this out and you can uh, ha have it for your own. So now let's go to the last book of the Old Testament, the last chapter, and read that. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat, like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under your soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Wow. Warning and promise. Mm -hmm. Expand on that for us, Ken. Okay, well, we're talking about Malachi. <clears throat> Malachi is the name of a prophet. There's nobody else in the Bible anywhere by the name of Malachi. And Malachi means my messenger, or if it, it, it may be a shortened for, form of Malachi, which means the messenger of the Lord. And we Seventh-day Adventists use that term to refer to somebody else, don't we? Mm -hmm. The messenger of the Lord, well, that should be a Malachi. So that's what the name Malachi means. And down here at the end, uh, the, the, apparently the, the people had been reestablished in the Promised Land. Uh, after about, we're talking now about a hundred years after the days of Haggai and Zechariah. We're talking about uh, somewhere down near the end of the ministries of Ezra and Nehemiah. Some people would su suggest that Nehemiah came, remember, back to Palestine, and he served as as, as minister, uh, as I'm sorry, as as leader of the of the people, the Jewish people, for a period of about twelve years. Then he went away for a period of time, and then he came back and was, a, was the, the governor of that area for a period of time again. Some people think that this book of Malachi maybe was written during that little period, a few years, between the two ministries or two, the two governorships of, of Nehemiah. Now, that's a little bit of speculation, but it gives us a little feel for when this happened. So we're talking about approximately 400 years before the time of Christ. And this is the last book written in the Old Testament as far as we know. And the question which we're going to ask ourselves coming up here is, why did God end like this? What did he have to say? Um, what's this Malachi all about? 
What we're going to find is the book of Malachi, we're not going to have a chance to do all of it, but there are eight um, dialectic passages in the book about Malachi. A good example is, and I'm reading from my Good News Bible again, Malachi 1 verse 2, God, the Lord says to his people, I have always loved you. And what's their response? But they reply, how have you shown you loved us? And then there's a discussion. And then later on, Malachi 1, 6, God, a son honors a father and a servant his master. If I'm a father, where's the honor due me? I'm, if I'm a master, where's the respect due me? Said the Lord Almighty and so forth. The people's response, how have we shown contempt for your name? And it goes on like that. So here's a bunch of people, this relatively pittance of people who come back to to. Jerusalem and, and, and the surrounding territories to try to rebuild their nation. And God says, these are the people I want to work with. And you remember the days of Ezra and Nehemiah? E Nehemiah had to tear hair out of their hairs and beards, out of their chins and beards to get them to, or their heads and, and chins, to try to get them to behave. He had to s close the gates on the Sabbath and lock them shut so they wouldn't do business on the Sabbath. I mean, it was a it was, uh, I mean, here were the people who, you know, and then they're, they're back into remarrying uh, the foreign women and all that kind of stuff. And he's, Nehemiah says, man, you're no better than Solomon. You know, he really compares them. And so right during that time, here's Malachi. And these people are saying, you know, God, what's with you? What do you want from us? And God says, he, God spells it out exactly. And they're always... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like a bunch of people dragging their weary way toward the kingdom, and only, only they're not headed for the kingdom at all at this rate. So what do we do with a book like this? Where do we go with it? Um, one of the very interesting pa dialogues that, that, or, or passages that fits this is, is found in, in Malachi chapter 3, starting with verse 6. Look at this. And actually... Yeah, let's do this, and then I'm going to come back to one in chapter 1 that's, that's interesting. I am the Lord, and I do not change, he says. And so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not yet completely lost. Not yet completely lost? What does that imply? You, like your ancestors before you, have turned away from my laws and have not kept them. Turn back to me, and I will turn to you. But you ask, what must we do to turn back to you? I ask you, is it right for a person to cheat God? Of course not. Yet you are cheating me. How, you ask, in the matter of tithes and offerings, God says. Look at this, what he says here. A curse is on all of you because the whole nation is cheating me. Bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test. God is saying, put me to the test. Um, and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you an abundance of all kinds of good things. I will not let insects destroy your crops. Your grapevines will be loaded with grapes. Then the people of all nations will call you happy because your land will be a good place to live. So here's an example of, of one of God's challenges. It says, you want to you find out whether I'm your God? Do what I say. Bring your tithes. You will get a blessing like you can't believe. Is yep. this a definition or a promise of of uh, prosperity? prosperity theology? The Jews certainly thought so. So that's all I have to do to get all of this no insects and grapevines loaded with the grades to just make sure I pay my tithe. Sounds like it, doesn't it? What do we do with that? I, I'm not sure when the time frame of this is. Well, he was promising that right then, wasn't he? Yeah, but even to them. You know, I pay my tithe and my grapes... <laughs> they didn't do so hot. They didn't do so hot? <laughs> well, maybe your livelihood doesn't depend on your grapes. <laughs> <laughs> There's another passage in Malachi, uh, and I, I, I hope that I'm, I'm not trying to jump away from that one, but we've got a lot of material to cover. Um, I hope this implies to us that Christians who really believe that we ought to be serving God We'll take this verse and take this passage and take it seriously and say, put God to the test. If you don't have a job, if, you, if you're in financial difficulty, pay your tithe and see if God will bless you. I know there have been many people who have yeah. made that test. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, they report that positively about it. Yeah, yeah. What about what about my time? How about if I tithe my time? Well, this, God this asked for to, to, God asked for a seventh of our time, not just a tenth. And so the other six days, I can do pretty well whatever I want. So oh, long that, would, that wouldn't be my understanding. So long as the other six days, God says you're supposed to work. And what does He think you're supposed to work at? Well, in ancient times, that, that it, it, people needed to work six days just to put food on the table, and a, house, uh, and a roof over their heads. <clears throat> in our day, we have we've we've discovered very complicated and very <coughs> excuse me sophisticated ways to you know multiply the efforts of our hands and make machines do work for us etc so we have a lot more discretionary time let me say than the ancients did you think um of course they didn't all have money right they they did a lot of barter they didn't, there wasn't even if you go back to earlier part of the old testament money hadn't even been invented okay so they pay their tithes. So how would they pay their tithes then? Oh, okay, you have 10 cows in your herd, 10 new cows in your herd, you take one for, for an offering to the Levites. Okay, the question I got, would the church take my cow today? Well, they would probably ask you to go sell it and bring the money to them. They do that in many parts oh, of the world. Yeah. So you bring you. I can take you to places where the offering is pumpkins and and and, and bread and and you know big old baskets up in front. They asked me to do that, so they wouldn't accept it unless it was money. What did the priest do with it? Well, <coughs> with it, money is money is the is the means of exchange in our our country today. It's, so that's why they ask you to bring money. It's culturally based. Yeah. yeah, it's culturally based. Yeah, that's but um, so what the, okay, what did the priests do <laughs> you with can all add those that, things? I guess. Well, remember that they had uh, one one twelfth originally of the tribe of tribes of Israel were supposed to be supported by that tithe. That's right. That was their income. They didn't have a huge chunk of. They had a little tiny area around forty eight cities, and that was that was their area, and enough to grow their vegetables and their you know, their garden stuff. And they were expected to get their support from the rest of the tribes. Let me take you another, another interesting thing. What do you do with Malachi 1 verses, um, well, really it's verse 2. The Lord says to his people, I've always loved you, but they reply, how have you shown your love for us? The Lord answers, Esau and Jacob were brothers, but I have loved Jacob and his descendants, and I have hated Esau and his descendants. I have devastated Esau's hill country and abandoned the land to jackals. What do you think of that? And it becomes a lot more complicated if you go over to Romans 9, which we don't have time to do now, but it says there, you know, I prophesied what was going to happen to these boys when they were still in Rachel's womb, and look what happened. Is that, is that fair? I was waiting for Jim to say Satan's the one who's always accusing God of not being fair. Doesn't this sound there, like... There are, there are the Bible writers... Uh, Love it less. I think, don't we... Haven't we used the word monotheism mm -hmm. to explain this kind of thing? Where, yeah. where they, they believe in one God. Mm-hmm. And that God has to be responsible for all the good and all the bad. Mm -hmm. well, and so, and so he takes that mindset and lets them write that way, and we get to sort it out. Well, but I mean, it wasn't. It was less confusing for them. Well, I mean, what, what we're what we're going to say here is that well, God, He really didn't hate those people, and but the author is just writing this as best as he understands. But you, I mean, it would seem to me that they they would be as confused as many readers today, and you know, this is Malachi into the. We got four thousand years. He could have straightened that out. Yeah. Why yeah, after prophet after? I mean, he can come down and he can appear to people in visions and. He can tell Daniel about the history of the theater. Why doesn't he say, now, by the way, let me clear something up here and get this straightened out. That, you know, you all need to stop using this hate thing all the time and 
blaming everything on me and thinking that I'm the one that, because it's confusing to people. And when Norm comes on the earth in another four or five thousand years, when he reads this, it's going to be confusing. Why doesn't he get that straightened out? Okay, what, let me make it worse. Why doesn't he, <laughs> why doesn't he, why doesn't he talk about this accuser, too, that se everybody seems to know about, but mm -hmm. can't quite put it together that he's the cause of the whole thing? Yeah. Go to Matthew 10, 37. Matthew 10, 37. Okay? And you know, it's these kinds of things, uh, you know, it really kind of all goes down to the, to the big question that has, that has disturbed and, and, and ruined the faith of, of a lot of people, I guess we would have to say, well, they just didn't explore, but like Darwin. Mm -hmm. The big thing that, that uh, someone said that he was, he, was, he was a believer when he was born and he was a believer when he died, but, but um, he just could not understand why, you know, little, big things ate little things. Mm -hmm. and, and why, I guess the question is why God doesn't intervene when we're, you know, and solve problems. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, <clears throat> I told you I was going to make it worse. Matthew 10, I'm, I'm going to start with 34. This is Jesus speaking. Now, you know, he's the one who brings peace and all that kind of stuff. He's the one who gave us the fifth commandment, which is honor your father and your mother, right? What, what verse is this in 10? 10, 37. I'm going to well, actually start with 34, but the verse I wouldn't even focus on is 37. Why are you going to make it worse? Do not... <laughs> Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the world. No, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to set sons against their fathers, daughters against their mothers, daughters-in-laws against their mother-in-law. Your worst enemies will be the members of your own family. That's what Jesus came to accomplish, right? Those who love their father or mother more than me are not fit to be my disciples. Those who love their sons or daughters more than me are not fit to be my disciples. And then you have to put with that Luke 14... Luke 14, 26. Look at Luke 14, 26. Okay. Once again, the, this is Jesus talking. I'll start with verse 25. Once when large crowds of people were going along with Jesus, he turned and said to them, those who come to me cannot be my disciples unless they love me more than they love father and mother. What it says literally is, unless they hate father and mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you read one of the more traditional RSV, translations. RSV Unless, says hate. Yeah. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his fa own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Okay. Let me read a little from Great Controversy on the topic of the sword. Okay. The gospel is a message of peace. Christianity is a system which, with receive, which received and obeyed would spread peace, harmony, happiness throughout the earth. But the world at large are under the control of Satan, Christ's bitterest foe. They hate the purity which reveals and condemns their sins, and they persecute and destroy those who would urge upon them its just and holy claims. It is in this sense, because the exalted truths it brings occasion hatred and strife, that the gospel is called a sword. Reference again? Great Controversy, page 47. Okay, well, the only way to explain all this is God is not trying to teach us to hate our parents. No. That can't be the truth. So what he's saying here is that I love, if you don't love me more than your parents, if the time comes when you have to choose between obeying your parents and obeying me, you have to obey me. It's a question of priority. Yeah. That's right. And you, you go back to... You go back to Jacob and Esau. Why did God love Jacob and hate Esau? Because Jacob kept making decisions in favor of God and Esau kept making decisions against God. What is God supposed to do? When you make that decision, you split from family. And some would say the gospel was a sword. If you go back to Genesis, you find out that Esau did that by marrying a couple of Canaanite wives. Yeah. And he just made the life of his parents miserable. But you take it further, right? That his descendants did, uh, formed a nation and there were nothing but trouble and they eventually went into oblivion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, let's look at a couple of other things in Malachi. Look at Malachi chapter 1, verse 14, just to give you a feel for this, this book. Malachi 1, verse 14. A curse on the cheater who sacrifices a worthless animal to me, he who, when he has in his flock a good animal that he promised to give me. For I am a great king, and people of all nations fear me. So does God say, cursed be the cheat? Why would God say that? The cheat is cursed because he has taken up with Satan. Mm -hmm. And Satan will what? lead him to where he'll feel cursed. <laughs> well, and, and God had given very specific instructions about how they were to bring their offerings. Absolutely. The very best kind of yes. offerings are supposed to be given to God. Now, if you decide... If you decide, okay, I've got this crippled lamb and I can't use any way, nobody wants to buy him, I can't sell him, let's take it to the temple and offer him. Offer him. What are you saying about God's instructions? Fool you on him, I'll do yeah. it my way. Yeah, exactly. Forget God's instructions, I'll do it my way. That's I'll, exactly er, right. Ergo Esau. Yeah. I mean, ergo uh, Cain. Yeah, Cain, same story. Yeah, exactly. So God isn't saying, you know, I don't like you because you cheated. I'm cursing you. He's saying, when you decide against me, you, you cheat yourself. Yeah. You just, if you choose to do things your way, that's exactly what Satan did in heaven. See, buried in there is the word obedience, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. And if obedience means a willingness to listen or take instruction... And, and, do you don't, and you don't want to take instruction from somebody you don't trust or, or somebody that doesn't fit your self-centered mm -hmm. way of doing things. What can you do? So, okay, so the biggest question here now is, why didn't God say it that way? Mm -hmm. Well, or did he? Because using It language, doesn't come out that way. It comes out language, here. <laughs> which, using language which was clear to them, but not clear to you. You think that language <laughs> like this will be clear to them, different than me? I, I mean, they, I guess the translators okay. didn't do a very good hold job. On, hold on, let me, let me back <laughs> up. Let me put your question, let me give you the other side of the coin. Okay. Do you believe that God would intentionally deceive them? Intentionally deceive them? Exactly, because that's what you're implying. Why would I be implying that? Well, you're saying that clearly this gives a no, wrong maybe picture. Maybe it's the truth. Okay. So, so, so if it's the truth. Truth that God just curses people because he doesn't like them and that kind of stuff you mean? He well, hates Esau from the moment he's question. born? When everything is done, mm -hmm. you know, Revelation is finished, all the prophecies have been done, and you're at the new heaven and the new earth. Mm -hmm. Is God going to take the blame for putting his kingdom on the ground of truth? Mm -hmm. Blame? Is he going to take the blame? He's going to sure. take responsibility for love. Yes. Love equals truth. No, no, you can't, you can't <laughs> find out what love is unless you know what hate is. You can't know what white is unless you know what black is. Well, that's why Jesus came to show his love by going to the depths of what people would do to God. So is God going to take the blame for that? Absolutely. Sure, he takes responsibility. He takes the responsibility for, for the effects of freedom. Mm -hmm. Why the is there evil? Freedom. Okay, so evil came by one of his creatures, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. yes. Because of the way he so. decided to run his universe. Yes. So... In a way, all the stuff that is being said in the Bible actually has happened. Wouldn't you say? Because, because what, he the Bible is the creator. Of what, of what we have done with the freedom that God has given us. The yes. freedom to choose. And the freedom that God has given us has given us the power to do what yep. we have done. Yep. Right. Okay, so that he would have to take the blame for that. Okay, let's do a test case. Let's take a very good test case. Look at Malachi 2 verse 16, just to, just to demonstrate your point. Malachi 2, 16. Um, Jim, you got, well, you've got a new King James. What does it say there? For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, 
for it covers one's garment with violence. The Lord of, is this right? Yeah, that's okay. right. Okay. <laughs> Says the Lord of you, hosts. You're hoping I wouldn't know. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know whether I was well, on the no right verse or not. Where we're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Okay. You have wearied the Lord with your words. <laughs> okay, now go back to Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24. <clears throat> it wasn't me that dwelt treacherously, it was my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll read my version of Deuteronomy 24. No there. The first four <laughs> verses. Suppose a man marries a woman and later decides he doesn't want her because he finds something about her that he doesn't like. So he writes out divorce papers, gives them to her, and sends her away from his home. Now this is God's instructions. Then, he, then suppose she marries another man. He also decides he doesn't want her. So he also writes out divorce papers and gives, it, gives them to her and sends her away from his home. Or suppose her second husband dies. In either case, her first husband is not to marry her again, and so forth. Okay? So in Deuteronomy, God says, you can do it. And Malachi says, no way. No, Malachi says God hates it. Okay. <laughs> it's not the same as saying no way. No. And didn't Jesus answer that question? Yeah, he did. What did he say? Well, you know what he said. He said God hates. <laughs> he said God hates divorce. No. Basically. Why did he? Why did he allow divorce? Well, because he, of the he hardness gave of your hearts and the stiffness right. of your necks. He well, gave instructions well, there you for go. the procedures. What, was, what would so, have been the condition in those days, given that society? If he hadn't had divorce papers. Well, women would be treated like chattel. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, in reality, God was, was being kind to women mm -hmm. by allowing this, given the society and He's, the way it ran at that time. By giving her these divorce papers, which many of the other nations didn't bother with, yeah. Basically, he w the woman was able to say, I was a legitimate wife for this man. He chose me. He married me. I was a legitimate wife, you know, and maybe he didn't like it or something happened in his brain or whatever. But n now that we're separated, hey, I'm free. I'm free. And, 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 and at, at least at one point in time, I was a legitimate wife. That's right. So that, because otherwise, they would be treated as, as, as pure prostitutes. Right. Okay, well, and that whole process, I think, fits with God hates divorce. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, we're coming to the, old, the end of the Old Testament. And we've, we're just about to the break time. But the question is, what, what has God demonstrated? What has he shown? What has he accomplished in all of the Old Testament? He's a little too long-suffering. He's a little too long suffering. He'd make a good angel. Should have come down and zapped him uh -huh. long before Malachi. And I see. Things would have been. You almost ought to ask the question what does it say? Not what it says about God, but what does it say about us? Uh huh. I mean, okay. that's the big thing because we were not very civilized part of the time. We were not very godly part of the time. That, doesn't it say God's been a failure? Well, if you want to, if your criteria is who, who won the big numbers, the answer is God's a failure. Or if God, yeah, if, you if, think, you only, if you only gets one. If you think God should be a control freak, then, yeah. then he failed. But if God is, operates on the basis of love, it takes time. But if he has proven his case of love, then he has won the war. Of course.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We were right in the middle of something there. If, if you were an angel standing next to the throne of God and you were watching the Old Testament, you watched the whole thing from Genesis, from the beautiful, beautiful Garden of Eden and those lovely two people that were put there, and you watched all the way through now to the end of Malachi, what would you say? Why, oh why? <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be kind of hard to, because it's hard to compare yeah. what happened in heaven, uh -huh. you know, in the war of heaven. Mm -hmm. So um, it may not be anything new. Yeah, they may say, it's happening again, Lord. Yeah. It, the, or the, 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 question, the question would still be there. I mean, if, you, if they didn't have any questions, then there wouldn't have been any reason to have the New Testament or the, the events of the New Testament or even the events after the New Testament. Okay. So what we have coming up now is a period of apparent silence on the part of God. 400 years. There's no prophets. There's no... Now we have the Apocrypha, some of the Apocryphal books that... Roman Catholics tend to accept, which most Protestants don't accept. Some of them were written during this time. Um, but uh, Protestants would say no. And so, but at least we have no major action from Malachi to Matthew. What was going we, on to How do we know it wasn't such good times that God didn't need to send any prophets? Usually he doesn't send prophets and things are really I, bad. Do you, do you really want to know what was going on during <laughs> that time? <laughs> oh, man. Well, do, let's talk about some of the major events that happened during that time, just briefly. One of the things that would ha happened was this. The people like Ezra, he was, seemed to be the one who started this, and others who followed him came to be known as the Great Synagogue. They were, they were the uh, group of, of scholars that put together... Uh, the Jewish teachings that came to be known by other names. But, um, anyway, Ezra said, you know, we've come back to this pile of rubble here in Jerusalem. And in a hundred years, we've hardly made any progress at all. Nehemiah came and they managed to finish the wall. And so they finally had at least one walled city. And they started put, putting things together. They, they, they begged people to come and live in Jerusalem because nobody wanted to have anything to do with Jerusalem. But Ezra said, okay, we're a, we're a bunch of nobodies out here, a little tiny group of people. What, what is there left to us? And he said, you know, what's left to us is the Word of God. Other nations may have the numbers, they may have the army, they may have the, the gold, they may have the power, etc. But we, we have God's Word. And so he started putting together for the first time something like a Bible. And he put together what basically the Jews still recognize as their Bible, what we would call the Old Testament. And he said, this is the thing that, this, this is us. This is what sets us apart from the rest of the world. We have a Bible. Well, almost immediately after that happened, uh, people started arguing about how to interpret it. Reading the Bible and back and forth. And so we had pretty soon people writing about, this is the way it should be done, and this is the way it should be done. And they developed all the rules that we know about that Jesus complained about so much in the New Testament. Rules after rules after rules after rules to try to force themselves to behave. They had been in the ditch on one side, living just like the pagans, practicing fertility cult religions, etc. And it seems like God managed to get them out of the ditch just long enough for them to race across the road and, and fall in the legalistic ditch on the other side of the road. And... So the question is, what, what was that all about? Why, why did God allow that? I mean, why did he? I mean, why did he even bother? I mean, why would he keep working with these people just so they could rally around and crucify his son? Couldn't God have found some better group of people to work with? It kind of looked like during that time they were mulling over what had happened mm -hmm. all this time before, and they were coming up with their own interpretations of what was happening. It was almost like the setting for, for Christ to come was developing during that time. Mm -hmm. So um, 
it happened during that time, and that's okay. exactly the setting. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's take your point. We've already suggested that if God's job was to try to get a lot, a huge number, a list of you know, people, a great, a lot of numbers of people on his side, it doesn't look like he's accomplishing that, does it? And by the time we get to the Old Testament, he's losing the numbers game, right? Do we all agree on that? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think we would Still all. Still losing the numbers well, Don't you game. think they're in this time, though, that, that this is the only, what, what the Jews ended up being was the only thing they could be other than going back exactly to what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, hold on. You, you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, now they've got rules. They're going to keep, they're going to keep idols out. They're going to keep all the, the they're gonna foreigners the out. Yeah, they're going to keep the all this. So now they are determined. They are going to do it. They're not going to make those same mistakes again. That's right. So the, now... They're going on to the other side of the extreme here. In reality, they haven't changed methodologies at all. Right. In, yeah, but they looked a lot different. But the methodology was the same. What do you they were going that? to keep rules. They were going to offer the right sacrifices, just like the heathens do. But they had a different one. But it was by their ritual they would be saved. Just like the heathens, by their ritual they would please their gods. There was no difference, and that's what Jesus came yeah, to they, show was the difference. You didn't see, you didn't see in the Old Testament the rules that they had when Jesus came, though. You didn't see the structures they had, yeah. all the all the things you had to do during the Sabbath, uh, and all that stuff. That wasn't present during the Old Testament. What you learn from the Old Testament is that that way didn't work. Yeah. And they're trying something else. Okay, so now they're and it's try almost like else. Jesus is going to so speak to this new else. new thing. They just changed their idols. That's they just they changed do. the God. The methodology is identical. No, I mm -hmm. think it's different. I oh. think it's different. I think it's a different age, a different way of thinking. It's it's different. I, the the effect is the same. I'll agree with that. But their methodology is yeah. different. Yeah, different it, it ritual, looked, it but different. but it's the same motivation. Yeah. Yeah, but they kept out they kept out foreign people. They kept out idols. They didn't touch idols. They didn't touch a lot of things. No, no, they That's had all of idols. different. That's different than they had in the Old Testament because they weren't scared of any of that stuff. Sure, you got this pagan woman, bring her over, you know. We'll we'll have a good time with her. Back when Jesus came, they would have nothing to do with that. Oh, well, no, that's not true. They, they had a wonderful time. They were just more careful about it. Well, they have started out in a new way briefly, but it didn't take them long to pervert it to a major, major way. Well, I just think okay, that well. it's, a different, it's a different situation, and Jesus was going to deal with this different situation now. It's a whole new, different ball game here, and it's still... A thing that goes off the the other side of the road. Okay, that's what I think. So now, now I'm going to ask you to do something that's a little different. What do you think Satan thinks as he's accomplished at this point in time? He's sitting back and rubbing his hands with glee. Yep. Yep. But the problem is, he still reads Genesis. Was it 15, or where the where it was promised that 315. 315. And he's still, he's still pondering that one. Yep. Yep. And so he's getting his people. He's, he's taking the people of God and he's saying, I have to prepare them so that when Jesus shows up, this Messiah, whatever's gonna, whatever God's going to do, I have to make sure that these people will reject him. That's right. I have to make sure that these people will, will, will reject him. So what did he do to get things ready? He split the Jewish people up into groups. There were the, the Pharisees. We know the most about the Pharisees. Jesus was always talking about the Pharisees. And they're the ones that multiplied the rules. And they had, in fact, they had very strict rules. You had to almost be independently wealthy so that you could practice religion full time in order to be a Pharisee. They were, they were never allowed to have more than 6,000 Pharisees at any one time. I don't know who made that rule, but apparently that was the, that was the rule. And so these were the upper class. We are the elite up here. And we're the ones who make the rules. We're the ones who decide what should be done. 
By contrast, we have the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the wealthy ones. They were the business owners. They were the people who turned the temple of God in Jerusalem into a fantastic money-making adventure. They're the ones who conducted that marketplace that Jesus said, get these things hence. You know, that was the work of the Sadducees. They were making buku bucks, as some of my friends would say, out of that, that process. That was the Sadducees. They, the Sadducees figured any, any method is, is fine so long as it accomplishes what we want it to accomplish. And so they, they did more cooperation with the Romans. They worked more closely with the Romans, although quietly. They didn't yeah. want people to know they were working right. with the Romans. But they basically purchased with money the right to be high priests. Think about how that's changed from the days of Aaron. Then there was another group that we know even less about called the Essenes. Now the Essenes have become very famous in, in the last, what, 50 years because they're the ones who left us the Dead Sea Scrolls. And those people became so concerned about the perversion that was going on in the temple in Jerusalem that they said, we, we, can't, we can't even worship there anymore. We've got to get out of here. And they went down and established their own little community down on the edge of the Dead Sea. And they were so strict about washings and purifications, all that kind of stuff, that they even made a rule that you can't go to the bathroom on the Sabbath. That would pervert the Sabbath day. So you can imagine what kind of provisions they had to make in advance for that kind of stuff. And washings and washings and washings and so forth. Then on another extreme were the Patriots what they call patriots, the, the zealots, as sometimes called. And these people said, you know, if we're serving God, if we're really going to worship God, then we have to oppose, for sure, any foreign domination. We've got to get rid of these Romans. And they were determined by hook or by crook to, to just get rid of the Romans. And these groups are fighting among themselves. I mean, imagine the, Sar the Sadducees who were more or less in charge and they're cooperating with the Romans. And here you have the Zealots who are determined to get rid of the Romans in every, by every possible way. And just, you know, this, this is the environment into which Jesus came. So why does it say in Galatians 4, verse 4, when the right time came, God sent his son? What was it about that time that made it right? It happened. <laughs> it happened. Well, the fullness of time is another way Paul uses yeah. that term. When conditions were right. That's right. Okay, what, that's what I want to know. What were the right conditions? Well, uh, well Hebrews we, had, we had a group, at least one of the conditions was we had a group of people who were worshiping God with everything they had they believe their They believe it, but with a wrong motive. Mm -hmm. And so, what, where would that lead that people that did that? I, that, I don't think that condition had, had mm -hmm. existed in any other time. Mm -hmm. They believed that because they were descendants of Abraham, they were, they were on their inside track. That God had to save them, basically. Okay? Even, even though they were not a, a political power or a cultural power of force uh, that would make them the crossword, crossroads of the world. Uh, the, the Roman Empire around them was the crossroads of the world. They, mm -hmm. Although they weren't the culture, they were within that culture. But they were so within it, a geographic <laughs> area that pretty much made that happen. Right, but it, it, it placed them in a circumstance where what went on there could be disseminated to the world Right. It, easily rather yeah. than down where the well, there are, were. There are a number of things that, that people have pointed out that make this the right time. There was pretty much one language through the civilized, the so-called civilized world, the Mediterranean world would be more accurate description of it. Uh, there was more or less one language spoken, so it was easy for the gospel to be spread. There was a common government, relative peace, we, we call it the Pax Romana, uh, the Roman peace uh, that was made it easy for a person to travel from one country to another and spread the gospel. So this is another thing that people point to sometimes. There were there was um, there were roads. There were you know the, the Roman government said they wanted to have, uh, make it relatively easy for anybody 
to go from any place to Rome. So there were, you know, and you've heard the old expression, all the roads lead to Rome. Well, that was the purpose, that was the intention of the Romans, to make all the roads lead to Rome. So the travel was a lot easier than it had been at some time in the past. Uh, you could, if you didn't know a new territory, you're heading in a completely new place. If you've got a road, it's a lot easier to find your way than it is if you're just heading across the hills and say, I guess it's over there somewhere, you know. So Paul took advantage of this. He followed the roads and went to the different cities that he needed to go to. So that made it easier in that respect. The Romans also moved their armies much quicker and more efficiently. Yes. To maintain the empire. Yeah. Never been done to quite that extent before. Yeah, exactly. But what about, um, what about a spiritual appetite? Yeah. Is it possible that um, even in all of this confusion, there was an appetite for a spiritual renewal if, mm. even with if, some, if someone came with a legitimate renewal? There would be people who would accept that. There were religions popping up all over the place, trying to, and of course, I think Satan was largely responsible for much of that. He had religions where there were dying, rising Christ. There were Lord's suppers. There were all kinds of stuff in these other religions. Satan had figured out as much as he could about what he thought this new religion was going to be, Christianity, and he had, he had duplicated it. He, 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 was, he was doing everything possible. The counterfeit, building the counterfeit, counterfeits. Yeah. Uh, but I would like to suggest to you that there is another reason that we often don't mention. What happened in the death of Christ? And we'll get to this a lot more when we get over and talk about the life of Christ and what it was all about. But when Jesus died on the, uh, his, died on the cross, he demonstrated three things very quickly. One, he said, does sin lead to death? Yes, it did. He died of sin on the cross. He didn't die of crucifixion or anything else. Two, and, and people had come to believe, well, yeah, people die, but it's, maybe it's because God is killing them or something like that. That's why people die. And we, he showed that, no. What did Jesus say? My God, my God, why have you and forsaken me? Why have you yeah. left me alone? It wasn't God who was doing the killing. But then the real big issue, and the fullness of the time was based on the third point, and that's this. The people who are out there crucifying Christ believed that they were doing it in the name of God. Mm -hmm. They were killing God in the name of God. They thought they were, they were obeying God. They were commandment keeping, tithe paying, paying Sabbath keeping, keeping etc. Yeah, health reforming, Adventists. They believed in the advent of the Messiah. Yeah, all those things. Sounds vaguely, vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, all those things. They, and they said, we're going to do this if it kills us. And they did. <laughs> they worshiped a wrong concept of God. Yeah, all about a wrong concept of God. In fact, I heard the other day, it says, if you have the wrong idea about God, you'll be wrong about everything else. Yeah, yeah. If your I've picture of God or concept of God is wrong. Well, looking through the Bible <laughs> now, in our a few minutes to conclude here, talking about the Old Testament, the intertestamental period, Looking through the Bible, did God ever accomplish anything by the use of force? No. Well, did, what, he, did he accomplish anything with the flood? Well, that's the question. Yeah. He, 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 he made him afraid. He, 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 he got rid of the he, enemies. He got rid of the enemies and had somebody that he could work with. Yeah, and how long was it before the, we had the Tower of Babel? Not very long. Not very long. What else? The children of Israel down in, in, in Egypt... And he had to, you know, had to send ten plagues just to get them out of Egypt, you know. Uh, and, and, and what what did he accomplish? Did he convince sending in those ten plagues? Did he convince Pharaoh to become a Christian no. or to become a Jew? No, but he, for, he convinced him to let the chil children go. Well, for three days anyway, and then okay. he went after them and got himself drowned. Yep. Yeah. So we have learned an important message message here from the Old Testament. You can't accomplish whatever it is that God wants to accomplish by the use of force. In fact, if we stop and think about it, that should be patently obvious because clearly, I mean, James 2.19 is an example, but we, could, we can just see this. God is obviously more powerful than the devil. So if he could win the great controversy by the use of force, he should have snapped his finger and done that at day one. Yeah. And for a second even. But he can't. So how does he accomplish what he wants to accomplish most? 
He has experience. to do the slow, painful, apparently losing methodology of saying, exercise your freedom. Let's watch what happens. Let me come down and make my appeals. Let Satan have his chance to make his appeals. And we'll watch pe what people do. And when it's all done and said, people will look at the results and say, whoa. Do we want to be on this side with Satan and all of his selfish people who are cut, cutting each other's throats and doing all that kind of stuff? Or do we want to be over here in practicing their selfishness? Or do we want to be over here with, on God's side where people love each other and care for each other and, and are, are generous and kind and all this kind of stuff? And man, if you, if you see those two sides as the sides, is, is it difficult to tell which side you want to be on? Not at all. Uh, did you ask? Did you ask the question? Did um, has God ever used force? Or no? It, I said, did God ever accomplish anything? Accomplish by everything. By using, anything okay. by using force? Yeah. All right. I see. But if he didn't accomplish something, he wouldn't have done it. What yeah. do you mean by accomplish? Well, well, convert, lasting. What we? What we? Yeah. Conversion of the of the, let, of the let soul. Me, let me take. Let me take a classic example. Look at Mount Sinai. What happened to Mount Sinai? He came down with thunder and lightning and black clouds and he shook that mountain and the children of Israel were down there with their, with their noses in the dirt and saying, please don't let God speak to us or we'll die. What did he accomplish? How long did it take for that whole fear thing to disappear? Just a few days. Just a few days. Well, I, I was thinking about Elijah too when he called up fire down yeah. from heaven and then he killed all those prophets yep. of Baal. It took off How long time. did that last? Mm -hmm. The and, next morning he was running for his life. And you can almost bring up the point about Satan being forced out of heaven and thrown to the earth. Mm -hmm. That was that was force, but um, that wasn't that didn't end anything until what's happened so far. Let's take another, some other examples from the Old Testament. Is it clear from the Old Testament anywhere what exactly God was trying to teach through the sanctuary system? Now we uh, as Christians... Well, I think there were a couple of things he was trying to teach. Okay. One, that a sinner could be made right again. Okay. A sinner could be separated from his sin okay. and, and be treated as though he had not sinned. Yeah. And that that process involved death. Okay. So, I think there were a couple lessons that, that they could have gotten from the sanctuary service. We Christians have, have capitalized on those lessons, which I agree with. M mostly we've gotten those lessons out of Hebrews, which is in the New Testament. And we've taken them back and applied them to the Old Testament. Do you think that children, do you think that the, if you had asked a, a, a 10 year old running around in the, in the Sinai desert, What's the purpose of this sanctuary here? Do you think he would have been able to explain it to you? Well, well don't you think he could have, he would have said, well, when I sin, I have to go down there and an animal has to die. Mm -hmm. Now, he, I don't know that he knew the, the implications of all of that, but he knew that mm -hmm. process and he knew it had to do with his sin. Because if he didn't sin, he didn't have to do it. Okay. Um, would you be comfortable worshiping the God of the Old Testament as you understand him? Well, Moses certainly was. Abraham was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There were there were a few who really he who, loved it. Who yeah, who 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 got it? But Job? The, the vast majority didn't. Well, to me I had no problem because Jesus was here. When were you talking about in the Old Testament? No, I was talking about my. I know about the Old Testament, but Jesus helps explain it. Yeah, okay, but I'm asking Testament. if you lived in the Old Testament, would you feel comfortable worshiping the God that you you read about in the Old Testament? Well, it'd be different than I'm well, doing it now. I don't know would, if I'd be comfortable or not. There's no way to tell. You would read about the the exodus from Egypt. You'd read about the the cloud. You'd read about the crossing the Red Sea. You'd read about crossing the Jordan. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of things that 
that you could read about in their history that would say, hey, dealing with this God that, is, that Moses was yeah. talking about is worthwhile. This, this, guy, this God is for real, That's not, right. a, not a chunk of rock. That's right. Job, Job didn't read about that, that stuff. I mean, it, 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 our, our general understanding is that he didn't have that information no Bible. available. And he seemed, to, he seemed to be real comfortable with a lot of things. What we find is this, and I want you to think about this for a moment. What we find in the Old Testament is like an examination. But the problem is, instead of giving us the questions, God has given us the answers, and he's asked us to figure out what the questions are. He's, the, the, the story is played out in human history. Here, we see the results. There it is, spelled out in the Old Testament, all spelled out for us. And we say, wow, so that's what happened. And now God says, okay, tell me what was going on behind the scenes. Oh, okay. Yeah? Rome, or Hebrews 1, In many and various ways God spoke to our, of old to our fathers by the prophets. Mm -hmm. But in these last days He has spoken to us by a Son. Mm -hmm. So many and various ways. And then at the fullness of time, the beings in the heavenly places learned with, with, with Jesus' experience of death. I'm sure glad there's a New Testament. <laughs> Yeah, uh, do you think that our verse in 1 Corinthians 4 and 9 applies to the Old Testament? 1 Corinthians 4 and 9 says, and I read it, for it seems to me, this is Paul speaking of course, for it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle for the whole world of angels and of human beings. Paul is saying that we as, as God's people are the theater, the word in, in Greek is theatron, the theater for the entire universe. I think all through the Bible from Genesis to when it's all finished, whenever that's going to be in the future, the universe is looking on and they're saying, we are so glad we are on God's side. Yeah. You know, we had, we've had a lot of questions down through the times and there have been times when we thought, God, get in there and do something, clean up the mess. But when it's all done and said, they're going to say, man, am I glad that worked out the way it did. And we say, hallelujah, God did it. We're on his side. And we hope that's the conclusion each of you would come to from the Old Testament. See you next week.